You got one fan out there. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we are trying to feel our way through um, this this morning. Had uh, already had some hiccups in a uh, few different things, but we're working through it. Jess back there working hard to make sure. Well, I think working hard to make sure it's streaming, making sure we can record it, making sure that we got music, making sure that uh, all sorts of things, and we're just trying to work through it. And we have to work through it for about a month or so, and then we'll be back in the sanctuary, and it'll be like brand new in here. But until then, we're just going to get close to each other, it looks like. Um, <laughs> if we have to rent some chairs, we can rent some chairs. That ain't, that ain't no big deal. Uh, but I want to welcome everyone here this morning. I want to go over some announcements to uh, begin with. Uh, first of all, in light of the renovations, uh, there are some cushions over there to the, to the pews that we're not going to be needing anymore. So if you got you got you want some cushions, uh, feel free to take those cushions that are over there and do whatever you can. Actually, I don't know what you're going to do with them, but you can do something with them, make something nice out of them. For all I know, but uh, they're over there in the sanctuary. If you want to go over there and take a look uh, after service, just to see how things are progressing. All the carpet is up right now. All the pews are gone. It's just old hardwood floors and uh, plywood where the fire was many years ago. Um, so you can see some history. You can go in there right now and see some history and see some burn marks and things like that. Uh, so it'd be cool to go over there and, t and check that out. Uh, there is a meal train going on for Miss Nelda Barnes right now. Um, she is at home, out of rehab. She's doing well, uh, but you can get go to that website there and um, sign up for that meal train. Uh, in light of Miss Miss Barnes as well, we uh, appreciate all the men that came out to her house on Saturday to help build her ramp. Uh, we had a good time of fellowship, uh, and she was extremely appreciative of it so thank you so much for that um you got your information about uh women auxiliary officers uh coming up uh we got a softball game on monday at 8 30 and then another one at tuesday at 7 30 uh so you, um, you feel free to come out uh, out to that also uh we have our second sunday night meeting this month and since this is the only place we can really meet we're going to have a joint session and that joint session i'm entitling uh, future casting the next 40 years starts today and we're going to be discussing the churches as it says in their uh, long-term goals and what kind of short-term goals uh, we need to set and reach in order to accomplish those long-term goals and that's for everyone uh, don't matter if you think you're going to be alive or dead in 40 years uh, your input matters right now so come out for that uh, that's Saturday, Sunday second Sunday night next Sunday night uh, at five o'clock for quarterly business meeting on Wednesday the 17th. Uh, the golf tournament information is in there. And also there's a special inclusion in your bulletin. This is a dementia workshop that's going to be taking place at the JCATS office um, in Selma. And um, if you know, if you've ever been around anybody that had dementia, it's a terrible, terrible disease, especially for those that are caretakers and family uh, that just kind of, it, it's just a horrible, it's a horrible thing. But there's going to be a workshop Thursday, April 11th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon uh, over to JCAT's office in Selma, and you can RSVP by calling uh, Miss Barbara Barber for that. Pass that. Uh, uh, any other prayer requests, I mean announcements that you know of? There's good days and bad days, but it's good to have you here this morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't we won't argue with you on that one. Mm. 
Any other prayer requests this morning? Pray, uh, announcements, prayer requests, anything? Pray that mom passed. Miss Irene? She's not doing it well. Okay. Pray that um, my brother Joel and his wife Jenny um, can get them hospital care now. Uh, they, the doctor said, you know, only two, a couple of days. He's been on the diagnosis, but on a couple of days he came from his experience. And also, um, Sheila, uh, I don't think she's made up her mind if she's going to have any more chemo or not. I talked to her yesterday. It's as strong as her voice has been since all this stuff started, mm. and she hasn't had chemo in a while. Okay. So um, I, I don't know if she's going to do it because really there's only like a four-month time period from not having it to having it. So right. Lift her up and, and try to get the wisdom. Okay. There you go. There you go. Any others? Right. Okay. Any others? Any others? Any others? <clears throat> if not, let's go to the Lord. And I'm, I'm going to ask y'all, let's all stand together. And I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll come forward as well. And we'll have our opening prayer. And we'll get ready to sing and worship through giving as well. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for bringing us here. Uh, thank you for your glory. Thank you for this place that we can come, uh, that we have a, a secondary place that we can meet in, when our sanctuary is being renovated, uh, that we can uh, still worship together um, in comfort, uh, even though it might be just a tad bit tight, Father. But we just we thank you for it, and uh, we pray that you would bless our service today as only you can, that uh, you might be glorified and that we might be changed in some way. Father, we also pray for every prayer request that was mentioned here today. Uh, the needs of those that are sick and those that are hurting and injured and uh, so many other things. We, we pray that you would intervene in those situations. Those that are, ha are battling addictions uh, today, we, pray, we lift them up. Those that are battling uh, tremendous amounts of stress in their life and depression and things like that. Father, you can bring relief to all of those. Um, and Father, that just as maybe we mentioned in Sunday school, Father, even for those that maybe don't have their focus in the right place, that they're focusing too much on the situation and not, a much, not as enough on the Savior. Father, everything we lift up to you and we ask that your will be done. Um, and Father, things that are out of people's control sometimes, let them know that you are in control and they can trust in you for it. Father, bless us as we worship through our singing, as we worship through our giving, later as we worship through the preaching and the hearing and the reading of, of your word. Father, may, and, and through our fellowship time, Father, get praise, get honor, and get glory through it all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And remain standing. As those places are coming forward, we're going to sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found here in the my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of fear, when fears are still, when striving Christ I stand in Christ 
take some time to greet each other while our young people um, are dismissed.
All right. We are... I am in slightly different waters here. Don't have my standard pool pit. Um, I'm going to be trying to um, do some different things that y'all are not worried about, but I'm worried about a little bit. But um, before we got into Easter, um, we were in a series uh, that was called I Could Play the Background. You remember that? We went through four different weeks. Um, and wh when it comes to the Bible, let me, uh, we, want, we want to jump back into this series. We went through four sermons last time. We're going to jump back and finish this uh, month out uh, with four more. And when it comes to the Bible, the people we remember the most are the ones that are, are the big stars, right? Moses and David and uh, Peter and Paul and people like that. We remember the big names. Uh, they're the ones that are talked about the most. Those are the ones that are out in the forefront, in the foreground. They're the ones that are always talking. They're the ones that are always uh, doing and the ones that are talked about the most. Um, you see, God granted them those gifts, obviously. God granted them those gifts and opportunities. But the truth is, everybody can't be a Moses. Everybody's not going to be a David. Everybody's not going to be a Peter. Not Everybody's going to be a Paul. Uh, they were extraordinary men. and large majority of people are ordinary. And, but there's nothing wrong with being ordinary. Not everybody has to be a Peter or Paul or David or Moses. While it is true that the world and the church needs people like that in the foreground all the time, it is just as much true that the world needs people in the background. Ordinary people in the background working. People that aren't always speaking and leading, but they are doing. Just because you're in the background and you're not, not actually doing. We need background players living godly lives and playing integral parts in the grand scheme of the kingdom. This series is about those types of people, the lesser known people of the Bible. People that uh, maybe in the Bible they um, have a small storyline or maybe they're mentioned a couple of times or maybe they're even mentioned once or maybe their name isn't even mentioned at all and then they kind of just disappear from Scripture. That's the kind of people we're looking at. Uh, but their names have been preserved and their, their stories have been pre pre preserved in the, in the holy canon of Scripture. And it does us well to kind of look at and consider these background players. And uh, what I want you to see, what I have wanted you to see, and what I want you to continue to see in this sermon series is that you do not have to be a singer. You do not have to be a teacher. You do not have to be a preacher or a deacon in anything, or anything like that. But you do have an important role to play. Every background player plays an important role. And there's something else that I want us to see through this series. It's what I think is the most important because it's the catalyst for what the series is. It comes from where I got the name of the series. I got this title of this series from a, a Christian rapper um, named Lecrae, and he did a song with another Christian uh, artist called Andy Minio. It was called I Could Play the Background. Or I think the song was just called Background, but the, the chorus goes, I mean, the song goes like this. I could play the background. I could play the background because I know sometimes I get in the way. This is a guy having a conversation with God. I could play the background. I could play the background because I know sometimes I get in the way. So won't you take the lead, lead, lead? Won't you take the lead, lead, lead? And I can play the background, background, and you can take the lead. Um, the song is about not making everything about yourself, but making it all about God. Sometimes it's about stepping out of the way and letting um, and, and letting God be out in front. It's about getting out of the way and let God take the lead and get top billing. So it doesn't matter if you, if you are in a leading role in some way. You are out in the foreground all the time. Or even if you're in the background, it doesn't matter. There's still someone that gets top billing in front of all of us, and that is God. This morning we're going to be looking at someone that understood what it meant to get out of the way. Somebody that understood what it meant to get out of the way, especially when it was apparent that God was beginning to work through someone else. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to open with me to Acts chapter 13. Today we're going to be looking at the most well-known of all the people that we're going to be looking at in this series. We, have, we went through four people that maybe one of them you knew last week last half of the series, a uh, guy named Simeon. Uh, this time you have heard of this man, this man named Barnabas. 
Uh, we first meet him in Acts chapter 4, and the last time we see him is Acts chapter 15. So he's not a small player. He's not somebody that just kind of uh, goes away and, and has this small role. He is a big major player, and uh, it kind of seems different for me to use him as a, as a background player. But honestly, he's one of the first ones I thought of uh, when I thought of this series. Um, and you, you will see why once we get to it. But Acts chapter 4 is where we first meet him, and then we last see him in Acts chapter 5. That's a lot of ground to cover. And here's the thing, we're not going to cover all that ground. We don't need to cover all that ground. He's most important from Acts chapter 11 through chapter 15. His name is mentioned more in those chapters probably than anybody else. Um, but we are going to cover some selected verses and passages in chapter 13 and 14. So what I want to do is I want to start with Acts chapter 13, beginning at verse Number one, it says there in the church that was in Antioch, there was prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they worshiped the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, set up, and as they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Let's just pause just for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, in the next several minutes as we discuss your word and look at this, this man named Paul, Father, open our eyes to see what we need to see. Open our hearts to receive what we need to receive. Open our minds to understand the things that we need to understand this morning so that our lives will be changed so that we can be more like Paul. We see Barnabas in this story, uh, in, this, in, in his narrative. Father, we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all know what I mean by dynamic duo? You know what? Yeah, yeah there has been some, huh? There we go. Yeah. There have been some dynamic duos in history. Two in, it, it's like two ingredients. Dynamic duo is like two ingredients come together and make something that's even better. Uh, it's like, I love peanut butter. I also love jelly. When you put them things together, especially like Miss Nelda does it, mm -hmm. that is a dynamic duo. Yeah, Macaroni and cheese, that yeah. is a dynamic duo. But I'm, it's not just food. I'm not just food motivated. <laughs> Batman and Robin, uh, some, of you, uh, some of you state fans might remember Fire and Ice, Rodney Monroe and Chris Corciani. They were a dynamic uh, duo. Um, Edie and Smith. Smith didn't play very well last night, so don't. Uh, um, if you like comedy, some of you may remember Abbott and Costello. Uh, what, what a dynamic duo they were. Uh, and there's, there's bigger dynamic duos than that. Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski, uh, Shaq and Kobe, Michael and Pippen. Uh, those were tremendous powerful, dynamic duos. And when it comes to church history, when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to missionary work, the dynamic duo of Barnabas and Paul are at the top of that list. There's no doubt about it. They are at the top of that list. If it was not for them, we would not have the book of Galatians at all. You see, Galatian, Galatia was not a city. Galatia was a region. It was made up of a bunch of different cities. And Paul and Barnabas went into, the, into those cities and they built churches in those areas and those uh, churches didn't just exist on their own they were tight-knit groups they communicated with one another almost like a conference or something like that or a convention they were so tightly knit together that when Paul decided to write to those churches he didn't write individual churches like he did to the Philippian church or to the Corinthian church he just wrote a letter to the whole place he said if I send it if I just call it Galatians they're going to get at each other because they're a tight-knit group the work on those churches in that region was owed directly to Barnabas, and to Paul. And none of it would have been accomplished had it not been for Barnabas. You see, Barnabas was a leader from Cyprus. And when the gospel had been extended outside of the Jewish people and into the Gentile world, the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas to check it out. You can see that in Acts chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. It says, it says news of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the grace of God. He rejoiced and exhorted them all to remain with the Lord, 
with a loyal heart, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and many people were added to the Lord. Why send Barnabas? I asked that question. Why, why send Barnabas? When I read this, why send Barnabas? Yes, I guess they sent him because he was a leader. But there was other leaders in Jerusalem. There were, uh, Jerusalem was where the church began. There was tons of leaders. There had to have been something about him. Well, yeah, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Well, I'm hoping that all the leaders in Jerusalem were like that. I think there had to be something else about Barnabas that you just don't see in the text here. And here's what I think it is. I think that there has always been, there was always that animosity between the Jews and the Gentile world. You see, the Jews were not a kind of people like, the Jewish faith was not a kind of religion like Christianity came to be. The Jewish faith, Christianity is all about going and sharing and making disciples. The Jewish world was not like that. They were close-knit. You didn't kind of go out, you didn't go outside of that Jewish world and, um, People, you would only convert people that wanted to come in. You didn't seek to convert people. There was not this, um, I don't know, uh, what was the word? Evangelism. Yeah, there's no evangelism. That's the way the Jewish culture was. There was no evangelism. Um, so you've got the, but now, you've, so there's this animosity that's always been there that they are the pagans, we are the people of God. But now these Jews have accepted Christ, they're Jewish converts, they're still Jewish, they still have their Jewish heritage, but they're Christians. And now they hear that these pagan Gentiles have converted to Christianity. And the question comes, are they our brothers? What are we supposed to do with that? I don't know what to do about that. You know what? Let's send Barnabas. Why send Barnabas? Because I think that Barnabas always had the same heart that God had. You see, God's heart isn't just for the Jewish people. The Jewish heart was for the Jewish people, but God's heart wasn't just for the Jewish people. You see, all through the Old Testament, God has a heart for everyone. And I think Barnabas had this type of heart that cared about the souls of not just his Jewish brothers and sisters, but of Gentiles as well. And he was the first one that came to mind. Let's send Barnabas. He'll figure it out. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. He had God's heart. That's why he was sent. And there was another reason that he was sent, which will become apparent as we move through this message today. And it's this. Not only was Barnabas a leader, Barnabas was a leader maker. Barnabas was a leader maker. That's why I chose him. That's why when I started this series, I knew he was going to be one that I wanted to, one of the first ones that I knew. Even though he is a major player, he's a leader maker because you're going to see that he had this awesome ability to play the foreground when it was necessary, but also he had this ability to step back and play the background when it, when it was called for. Playing the foreground means being a leader. Playing the background that means being a leader maker. That's what Paul, that's what Barnabas was. As we talk about Barnabas as a leader maker today, my hope for this message is that it convicts and that it conforms our hearts. That it convicts us and conforms our heart to become leader makers ourselves. Um, just messed up my just messed up my PowerPoint by messing with this somehow. Um, let me say this. Let me repeat that. As we talk about Barnabas as a leader maker today, my hope is for this message is that we all become leader makers and that we become conscious of how and when to play the background so that God gets the ultimate glory. You see, there's a lot of qualities about Barnabas's life that are key to becoming leader makers like he was, in, but we're going to focus only on two qualities. He had lots of qualities that made him a leader maker, but there's actually two qualities that I want, to, I want to kind of focus in on this morning that we need to incorporate in our lives. And the first one is this. Leader makers are strong encouragers. Leader makers are strong encouragers. 
How do we know that about Barnabas? Well, it's literally in his name. It's literally in his name. Something that you may not know is that Barnabas was not born with that name. That's not the name his mama gave him. He was not born Barnabas with encouragement. You see, evidently, he was well known by the disciples. He was well known by the apostles. And he was a huge supporter of them. It's almost like he consistently was encouraging. God, you guys are doing a great job. You are doing a great job. You guys just need to keep it up. He's a tremendous encourager. So much of his encourager that the apostle said, man, that's what we're going to call you. I ain't going to call you. I ain't going to call you uh, Joseph. I'm not going to call you by your name. I'm going to give you a nickname. You're the encourager. You are son of encouragement. That was Barnabas. But the evidence that he was a strong encourager doesn't end there. You know that Paul murdered Christians before he became missionary, right? And he was on his way to, to kill more Christians on his way to Damascus before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ met him on that road and converted his life, and he was radically changed. And after his conversion, Paul's excited about Christ. He took that same passion for Christ, uh, for uh, the, the, the legalistic Jewish faith that he has to murder Christians. Now he's taking that same passion into making Christians. And he's excited about it. And the first thing he wants, he wants to go to the disciples. I want to go to the apostles. I want to yoke up with them. I want to take what I've got and yoke it up with them. And he decides he wants to go. And uh, Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 9 uh, verses 26 through 27 says this is what happens when he did. It said, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join them, but they all feared him, not believing he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and led him to the apostles. You see, Barnabas alone, out of all the other apostles, out of all the other disciples, out of all the other people at the, at the church in Jerusalem, Barnabas alone stood up for Paul. Barnabas alone is willing to set aside Paul's history of persecution and give him a new chance to prove himself as a Christian convert. And I love the language that it used. It said that Barnabas took him. Barnabas took him. You see, here's an excited Paul that God has radically converted and started working through and God is calling him to go to Jerusalem. And Paul is following that call, and he thinks it's going to be exciting. As soon as I get it, I'm going, to, I'm going to work hand in hand with Peter, James, and John. I'm going to work together with all those people. It's going to be so exciting. And instead, what happens? They reject him. So here's a, an excited Christian that has been shut down in some way because they're afraid of him and because they, re- they don't even believe he's really a Christian. But in steps Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and it says he... It, He took him. The word means to bring to himself. It's a middle verb. It means to bring to himself. It's almost as though Barnabas went to this discouraged Paul and he put his arm around him. He said, hey, brother, I believe you. Not only do I believe you, I believe in you. I believe in God's calling in you. I believe God is using you. I believe God is going to use you. And I'm going to make those disciples, I'm going to make those apostles believe it too. Come on, let's go back. Come on, let's go back. What, and with that encouragement, he takes Paul back to those apostles and encourages them to believe in Paul too. And in doing that, God used Barnabas to give the church the greatest missionary and the greatest theologian and the greatest evangelist that ever lived. People need encouragement in this world, don't they? It's a cruel world. I'm sure NC State fans could use some encouragement this morning. (laughs) Talked up that big man so much and he didn't even show up last night. All those, all those banners that are waving in the Dean Dome for championships are waving at y'all just like the Purdue fans were last night. And all them banners say, I can say whatever I want <laughs> till y'all get some more. But people need encouragement, right? People need encouragement. And that's what the Bible teaches for us Christians. The Bible teaches us to be encouraging. First of all, it teaches that God is an encourager. In Romans chapter 15, verse number 5, it says, Now may the God of of, of perseverance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in according 
in accordance with Christ Jesus. You see, God is an encourager, the God of encouragement. God is an encourager. That's what he does for us. And we are to follow him, the scripture says, and to imitate him. You see, and, and Paul said that the Thessalonian church had it down pat. Paul writes to them and he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, or at, at least verse 11, so comfort yourselves together and edify, or the word is encourage one another, just as you are doing. He said, keep encouraging, you, you're, doing, you're doing a great job. Paul's, being, Paul's learned something from Barnabas when he's writing this. You guys are doing a great job. Keep encouraging one one another. Keep doing what you're doing. I think the writer of Hebrews is even more clear. He says in in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24, I'm going to read through 25. It says, and let us consider how to spur or encourage one another unto good works or to love one another and unto good works. And let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but let us exhort or encourage one another, especially as you see the day Approaching. I hope you look. I hope you look out around this world and th- and hope you see that the day is fast approaching. The day of the Lord is fast approaching, and we should have an urgency to be encouraging one another. And where did this verse take place? I didn't. I didn't put. I didn't put verse twenty five on here. But Paul, the writer is saying that happens at church when you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You see, when the early church needed leaders. Somebody had to make them. When the early church needed leaders, somebody had to make them. They needed to be, there needed to be a strong encourager. And that's exactly what you see from Christ with the apostles, especially before the night of his crucifixion. We talked about the the, the evening with the king, how encouraging he was for them before he's getting ready to leave them, before he kind of takes a background seat and they become the foreground. He was an encourager. And we're called to be like him. We're called to be encouraged, especially for the purpose of making leaders. We all need to ask ourselves, are we being encouragers? Am I encouraging the next group of leaders to be just that? Or am I hindering them in some way? Am I I encouraging or hindering? Is there a potential future leader that can do what you're doing, but you just won't let them do it? That's the kind of questions we need to be asking. I'll tell you this. In situations like that, encouragement isn't, I'll do it. Encouragement is, you can do it. You see the difference? Encouragement isn't, I can do it, I'll do it. Encouragement is, hey, you can do it. Even if I can do it, you can do it. Leader makers are strong encouragers. Now, Barnabas was a leader maker because he was a strong encourager to those that would be leaders, but that wasn't his only quality um, that made him an effective leader maker. He also had a very good quality called humility that would allow him to fade from the foreground and go into and kind of sink into the background when the time came. And that's his second quality. And we'll say it like this. Leader makers are self Effacing. Effacing means to kind of erase from the surface. So self-effacing means to try to remove yourself from the foreground and to fade into the background. Self-effacing, remove yourself from the foreground and to fade into the background. There may not be anyone that does this as well as Barnabas, in my opinion. When you read, when you read again in, ver- in Acts chapter 13, verse number 2, As they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. You see, word order is important in Greek. It's not like the the Greek language doesn't follow the same sort of um, word order that we use. We use. In English, we use subject, verb, object. I watched basketball. Hebrew uses... Uh, verb, subject, object. Watched I basketball. Greek doesn't follow those sort of word orders. Greek is, you can throw subject, verbs, object, you can throw them anywhere you want to. The emphasis in their word order is whatever comes at the beginning has prominence. It is the most important. So when there's a list, if something is listed first in that list, that person has the position, uh, has the greater 
position. It's like when you when you when you when Jesus when in the New Testament in the Gospels when Jesus calls the disciples and he calls the inner three like at the Mount of Transfiguration or at the Garden of Gethsemane he called who's listed first Peter James and John why Peter first because he's obvious the leader he's obviously the spokesman uh, for the rest of them he holds a special position there and here when Barnabas and Paul were first sent off. Notice who the Holy Spirit positioned first. It's Barnabas. It's Barnabas. That's the same order you see back in chapter, uh, back in the last verse of chapter 11, when Barnabas went, uh, went and brought Paul back with him to Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 30 says, Indeed they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of first Paul, I mean Barnabas, and Saul. We see it again in the last verse of chapter 12 when after having gone to Jerusalem, he brought John, they, they both brought John Mark back with them, back to Antioch with them. And Acts 12, 25 says, When Barnabas and Saul had fulfilled their ministry, they returned from Jerusalem and took with them John who said Mark. When Barnabas and Saul, you see that Barnabas holds that he holds the foreground. He holds the, the position there. And it's obvious from the word order in chapter 11 and chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13 that Barnabas holds the greater position. He's in the foreground. He's the one primarily in the foreground, and rightly so because he's older. He's more experienced. He ought to be in the foreground. But something happens here in chapter 13 that I want us to see. Read with me beginning at verse number 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they went to Cyprus. And when they had arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John as an assistant. And when they had gone through the whole island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elymas, the, sor the sorcerer, which is his name by interpretation, opposed them, trying to divert the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who is called Paul, and he's never, I don't think he's called Paul, Saul again after this point, by the way, once he steps into this position. Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared at him and said, You son of the devil! Enemy of the righteous, enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and of all fraud, will you not cease perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now look, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell on him and went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And when the proconsul saw what happened, he believed and was astonished at the doctrine. You see, when Paul and Barnabas met this sorcerer, this charlatan, it's Paul that speaks up first. Suddenly, Barnabas had been in the background. All of a sudden, Paul speaks up, and he's the first one, and he blasts him. And he uses a lot different tactic than Barnabas would. Barnabas was not this kind of fiery guy. Barnabas got things done, but he got things done in his own way. Paul goes out and he blasts this guy and uses harsher language and abrasive language than Barnabas would ever use. And Barnabas does what? He steps back and he lets him. It's not the way he would have done it, but he sees God at work. He sits back, doesn't say a word, he sees God at work. And something interesting happens in verse number 13. It says, now when Paul and his companions set sail from, from Paphos, Paul and his companions, Paul and his company. You see, Barnabas doesn't even get mentioned here. And the next time you see their names together, it's all the way down in verse number 43. The next time you see their names together is all the way down in verse number 43. And who is mentioned first? Paul. Paul and Barnabas. Paul now has become the, the, the greater 
position, the greater priority there. Again, in verse 46, it is Paul and Barnabas. Then again, in verse number 50, it is Paul and Barnabas. After the event of the charlatan sorcerer, the name order forever changes. Except for a couple of times, once Paul and Barnabas go back to um, Barnabas' own home soil turf of Jerusalem. So what happened at that event that caused the order to change? I think it's that Barnabas saw God working through Paul. He got himself out of the way. He didn't quit the ministry. He's right with Paul every step of the way. But he's not the person of importance anymore. He steps back. He steps back out of the way. He could have spoken it, anything. He could have spoken up in his own way and probably had the same results, but it would not have helped Paul. When they meet that sorcerer, Barnabas could have stood right up and he could have he said, Paul, I got this. He could have said, Paul, I got it like I got everything else. And handled it and would have had the same result. But you know who it wouldn't have helped? It would have never helped Paul become a leader. He stepped back and said, let Paul go ahead and go. Go ahead and do it. If you look over in chapter 2, I mean chapter 14, you'll see something interesting there. When Paul and Barnabas uh, go to Lystra, you look at verse number 8. It says, And in Lystra there sat a man crippled with his feet, who had never walked and was lame from his birth. And he heard Paul speaking, who looked intently at him and perceived that he had faith to be healed and said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he jumped and walked. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying, uh, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Jupiter or Zeus. That's the Greek word is Zeus there. And uh, Paul, they called Mercury or the Greek word is Hermes, because he was the speaker. Some locals thought that Barnabas and Paul were gods. And they are recognized when they call Barnabas Zeus. Zeus is the greatest of the gods, but Zeus is the kind of God that kind of sits back and does absolutely Nothing. He sits back in the background. So when they call him Zeus or they call him Jupiter, they're saying they're, they're recognizing his position. They're recognizing his honor and things like that. But they call Paul Mercury or Hermes, which is that that was Zeus's or Jupiter's spokesman. If, if Zeus wanted something said, he would have Hermes do it. Or if Jupiter wanted something said, he would have Mercury to say it putting the position of prominence on, um, on Paul there. Barnabas held the authority in the background, and Paul was the one out in front to be heard. That's the self-effacing quality of Barnabas. He had, he had all the authority. He had all the experience, but God was at work in Paul. And Barnabas recognized that, and he was not about to get in Paul's way. That's humility as well. Self-effacing humility. He was satisfied to play the background as a leader because there was another leader in the making. That's the, that's the same self-effacing humility that John the Baptist had and showed towards G Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in John, 30, uh, John 3.30? He must increase, I must decrease. Christ has got to step forward, and I've got to, he's got to come to the foreground. I've got to sink into the background. I'm not, he, I'm not quitting the work. I'm just going to fade into the background, and I'm going to work from there. That's the kind of quality Paul uh, writes to the Philippians about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he says, Let nothing be done out of strife or conceit, but in humility let each esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Put others before yourself. Self-effacing. Humility. Put, sink into the background and make sure other people get seen. 
You can't be self-effacing if you always want the praise, if you always want the glory, if you always want control. That's not self-effacing, and that doesn't make leaders. J.I. Packer, a Christian theologian, once made a brilliant illustration on this. He wrote about the Holy Spirit's floodlight ministry. And as it's kind of recorded in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, a floodlight doesn't illuminate itself, does it? Floodlight illuminates something else, like a spotlight in a theater. You got somebody running the spotlight, but he, the spotlight's not on him. It's on somebody. It's on, the, it's, on the, um, it's on the actors on the stage. The spotlight doesn't draw attention to himself. And you find that about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always pointing to Christ. You read John chapter 14, 15, and 16. It's all about the Holy Spirit spotlighting or floodlighting Jesus Christ. Even though the Holy Spirit is just as much God, fully God, is satisfied to play the background so as to act as a floodlight for Jesus Christ. Our culture is all about floodlighting ourselves. You realize that? That's what our culture is. It's all about floodlighting ourselves. Not being a floodlight, but floodlighting ourselves. We live in a world that's all about selfies. I see Facebook. We flood our accounts with pictures of ourselves, what we're doing and what we look like. It's a culture of, of tooting your own horn, right? Preachers aren't, aren't immune to it. Preachers, a lot of preachers have this me mentality and are driven to be recognized and have the biggest and the best, to be far reaching and far wide and acclaimed. But it's not about me, it's about he. It's not about tooting our own horn, it's about the things of others. It's not about being floodlighted it's about floodlighting others it's not about selfies it's about self effacing self effacement in this church in the church in american church but in this church itself we need to learn from barnabas with paul the very capable barnabas slips into the background to be a floodlight for the rising paul and so behind the emergence of the greatest theologian and evangelist and missionary the church has ever seen was a humbly fading Barnabas who pushed Paul forward. That's a beautiful thought to me. And he didn't do it because he was too old. He did it because he saw God working. They wanted to get out of the way. A leader maker is humble and self-effacing. They have the beautiful ability to fade into the background as they push others into the foreground. They do not love the praise of men. They aren't addicted to the limelight. They are wonderfully self-effacing, willing to let others emerge. Willing to let others emerge as leaders, as the leaders that God is working them towards. We need more leaders today, don't we? We need more leaders, absolutely. We need more Christian leaders in this world, and we need more godly leaders in the church. And here's what I'm trying to say. The call to be a leader maker isn't necessarily a call for any of you to stop being leaders yourself. It's a call to know when to encourage others to be the leaders that God's calling them to. And a call to know when to step back so that others can emerge as the leaders that it's apparent they are. It's a call to, not to desire the floodlight, but to become a floodlight for someone else. To push others forward ahead of you. Maybe to let go where someone else can grab a hold. Not to stop working, but just to work in a different way. This is, this is your take on truth. Leader makers must be willing to fade into the background in order to encourage those God is bringing to the foreground. Leader makers must be willing to fade into the background, play a different role, work a different role, in order to encourage those God is bringing to the foreground. God is bringing people to the foreground at Johnston Union. 
in this church. And the question we all have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to step aside and encourage them as we watch God work, just like Barnabas did with Paul? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I so love the narrative of Barnabas, his wisdom to know when to be in the foreground, when to step into the background, how to raise up leaders, his, his heart for everyone. Father, there's so much about him that we didn't even have time for, his patience with the failures of others. Um, so much, so much here, uh, his forgiveness. Um, but Father, what we have seen is enough to, to cause us and convict us to be leader makers just like he was, to encourage people that we know you are calling to be leaders and to selfie face to slip into the background so that others can play that foreground that is obvious you're calling them towards father bless us now you are a wonderful father that um, um, that loves us and encourages us each and every day and your son pretty much selfie faced when he took our punishment on the cross so that we can step into the foreground of glory one day by grace through faith. Father, bless us as we close in song. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, love, if you would stand, we're going to close with good, good Father. And I think the words will be on the screen. Yes, good, good Father. Just don't hear no music. Let's start it over. <laughs> Technical gear. <laughs> huh? I either have to do that or just say amen. Let's, uh, I'll give you one more chance. You still see the light on on that? Okay. I'm worried, been worried. Well, let's, uh, let's close with something else. Something we can sing a cappella good. Somebody give me something. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but blind but now I see let's close in prayer Heavenly Father thank you for a wonderful day to worship Father thank you for this place that we can come this secondary place that we can come um, help us to take uh, what we have learned here to a world that needs it and not just to a world that needs it but to help, us, to help us to use what we've learned here in the church amongst each other to encourage and to self-efface for your glory help us to be stronger encouragers each and every day and help us to, to decrease so that you might increase and father we pray all these things in jesus name and all god's people said amen, amen.